for this topic, we're talking about power, men in power, and power games. So the thing that stood out to me first um, was that power games seem to be uh, by by people who don't want the other to know that their game is uh, afoot, right? Uh-huh. They they want to play them in in the shadows. They don't want the other to see what they're doing, right? And so I would say this is people's typical definition of manipulation, yeah. right? It's it's um, trying to claim or gather power, but unseen. Mm-hmm. And so I think this is probably a two-part question. I would be curious to hear more about that, the the idea of the games being played behind the scenes. And I'm wondering, is there a healthy way to exchange power in relationships and have um, have power be seen in the light, right? Not to be afraid of the fact that there there is power over or power to affect change, um, but just do it in in a way that that everybody sees what's going on. Yes, I would affirm the second question. But I'd love to hear, do you have an example of a power game that you felt yourself in recently? Even if it's unconscious and, you know, not fully defined, what what are you experiencing in this realm? The, the thing that comes to mind first is an idea that Justin and Anthony um, and I have been talking about is the idea of like uh, trying to be impressive, right? And not, not let the other person know that you're trying to be Um so like let's say you you meet somebody that you'd like to be impressed by you, right? So you have to you you think into your library of oh okay, what's impressive about me? Um let me subtly find ways to insert that into the conversation, even if it doesn't quite flow. It it I might do it slightly awkwardly, but um actually now that that's really interesting. I'm wondering if like seduction techniques are essentially just ways of inserting those things more smoothly. <laughs> right? Not making it awkwardly obvious that I'm trying to be impressive. Definitely. Right? And so I would say this is a power game, right? We don't want this girl to notice that I don't feel totally comfortable with myself in this moment. So let me let me tell her about my greatest accomplishment. But don't brag about it. You know, this is a power game. This is manipulation. It's it's trying to go behind the scenes, under the radar. And um, there's a better way, I'm sure of it. Mm-hmm. And there's, there's the inverse to what you said. So one way of trying to maintain a, a position of power is to always be impressive, like always. And, you know, lift your chin up and wear a fancy literary scarf and talk about all the wild places that you've been to i definitely use my traveler's ego uh, to look impressive over the years i went to all these countries tell a story from a place that nobody has been to uh, in her frame of reference Um, but then you might also if you don't want to try and be impressive you could also knock her down so if she tries to say something impressive or even normal you make fun of it so you continually degrade her and and that's in some of the old seduction workbooks <laughs> and advice as well, right? Knock down her ego, and, and people do that. They they do both, and many many more besides. I think power games go all the way down, and the essence, I believe, of uh, power games, and and no matter how clean, you know, I I feel yeah, I've done a lot of work, and and I've looked at my shadow and the shadow in people a lot. And I'm willing to come clean and be authentic a lot in my relationships. And still there's a continual kind of thing, like a back and forth between me and my partner, where there are, you know, she's trying to exert power and get some of the things that she wants without owning up to it. And I have ways of maintaining my power or preempting her. So these these things could be all the time and we could keep a log and sit every week. We could go on a date and say, these are the ways that I think you're playing power games with me and I'm playing power games with you. So, so very, very often, um, and, and I think they're very, very hard to eliminate because the root of the power game is we all have, we all have core fears in our psyche. I fear being abandoned. I fear being ridiculed. 
I fear being shamed in public. I fear being uh, ostracized, kicked out. I fear being annihilated. And there are all kinds of vulnerabilities that I don't want people to put my finger on. So I'm, I'm happy if people critique my work, but I, I don't want anyone to critique my singing in the shower, let's say. So there are all kinds of vulnerable things um, that I don't want uh, people to press on. And in order for that to happen, I'll keep some kind of facade up. I'm put up, I put off by your typing, guys, so I, I need you to mute that in order just to continue. Okay. So we are... We're naturally defending against our worst fears happening all the time. Naturally. There is either a uh, constant kind of set of barriers that we put up, constant power games that we're running, or there is uh, reactionary power games, like we're chill and open most of the time, but as soon as we get a little bit afraid, boom, we, we, we play something, we do something, we, we demean the other, we create distance, we take the resources for ourselves, we close the door, we go out. Um, so we can be reactive in the way that we try and keep our sense of control. Because we don't want our worst fears happening to us. We don't want to be humiliated or seen through. And we don't want the parts of us that we hate, let's say, or dislike, we don't want them to surface and be seen and be judged. We don't want to be left. So because of these fears, we're constantly putting up defenses, and she is too. Um, but most people are not completely aware of their worst fears. We're, we're aware of some of them, but not all of them. And we're often not very aware of our defenses either. And therefore, because we're playing these games to try and get while also defending, we're not aware of many of those. So it, it can take a long time until we figure out how our egos are operating in order to keep us safe. And what egos do when they're operating is, is try and take power without admitting it or trying to keep stable without admitting it. And um, I, I think most people in relationship just see that as normal. It's blind, but that's the normal way things are. Um, but you can get in some really, quite quickly, you can get in some toxic patterns where it's like, this is draining my energy. Being with this woman, we have this back and forth. Every time she does this, I feel really bad. I don't know why. It seems to be a bit of a life suck. Is it neediness? Is it complaining? I, it's very hard to actually articulate what's going on in some of these power games. And what I find, and, and consequently, the walls go up and the intimacy goes down and the sense of closeness and even kind of resentment starts brewing in the mind. And it's like, wow, I don't even realize what's going on. But as the weeks go by, I just feel more and more resentment for my partner. Uh, it's been a long time since we had a really beautiful connection. And I'm just starting to take the bad stink that there is in this room as normal. How the hell do I get out of here? Well, I could speak about my bad stink. That's a start. But then to untangle all the things that we do to actually diminish the other person. And these could be really subtle. Just taking the, you know, just making fun of your love for baseball. Oh, you know, Jane, he likes baseball. What a middle of the road, boring. <laughs> you know, like they, they could just like a girlfriend, your girlfriend comes into the room and she makes some bad thing about you liking baseball in front of everyone else. You can't correct her because that's, not graceful social behavior so you let it slide and later on you might have a fight but you might let it go but over the course of time this little power game adds up and becomes big very big and it's very hard to address all the power games so one i think beautiful thing is one to to understand this notion of trying to maintain a bit of power and being like how do i actually do it we all do it no one here is clean no one's watching this video and they're such a good guy they're not playing a power game probably if you, you you're trying to prove to the world that you're a good guy you're the playing the biggest power game and probably no one really knows who you are and your intimacy is crap i'm a nice guy i never have conflict yeah you wait until you're actually authentic but Understanding the little power games you play is, is, is brutal, hard shadow work. But when I see myself doing one, like you're saying, just to say on a first date, and I've said, <laughs> I've both said this as a vulnerable admission, and I've said this as well as a power game. You know, it goes in loops. Just saying, 
hey, I, I just spent five minutes telling you about my traveling. And honestly, I just told you that to try and impress you. First of all, that could be me opening. But it could also be a version of authenticity gain or vulnerability gain, where I'm showing you that I'm self-aware, but I'm not actually telling you that there's a double loop. I'm, I'm trying to show you how self-aware I am right now as a, as, a, as a ruse to show you that I'm powerful. So you can get caught in a spiral, but admitting it outright. I, had a I want to make this a bit more concrete. I had a really beautiful conversation with a woman, um, and we met in a, in a nightclub, and we had a brief, very highly charged sexual repartee with each other where I came onto her very, very strongly, and she liked it, but she put up a wall, and I came on strong, and I saw she liked it. She gave me her number, and we parted ways. It all happened in a couple of minutes. It was like a movie scene, you know, very aggressive, seductive move. All right, so we met up for a, uh, a, an afternoon drink, like a couple of days later. And she starts telling me something, and, I, and, and my heart opens, actually. I'm just like, wow, this girl's really, really kind and sweet. I, what, she's telling me all this really sweet stuff. And I said, you know, and I said this honestly, like very authentically, you know, our, our time when we met the other night until now, we've been playing this like high flame game of seduction with each other. But what you just said to me really touched me. I'm, I loved hearing about your, your grandmother or your art or whatever you were talking about. I really loved it. And it just, um, we were unconsciously, or consciously, we were wrapped up. The entire format of our interaction together was one as high stakes game of seduction. And by speaking one sentence, I said, we've been playing high stakes game of seduction right now, but I've got another mode. And you just expressed to you another facet of you, and it touched another facet of me. I'm going to let go of all of that because it was a bit of a power game, and I'm going to come with you more authentic now. And it felt like the the, the air softened, the texture of the the you know the colors, the sky. I could start to hear the animals, the birds sing in the trees. It, it, the, the moment, the whole moment, just shifted and deepened. And then she got red in the face and was like. Oh my God, you, you're a man with another depth here and you saw me. And then I can relate to that. The intimacy came. And, and for sure, you know, if, if we had stayed in connection for longer, someone would have started a game again and it would have made the, almost the air around us, the atmosphere get hard. But then if someone was able to pick it out and give a name to it, we could stop the game and come back to this moment of softness. As I said before, softness, intimacy, non-trying. All the thing that all the things that make connection feel really good. Beautiful. It reminded me of something that Zen says that I've I've often wondered about. He he talks about when he meets a girl, and he can tell it's on. She she knows that he knows, kind of thing, right? And so he talks kind of about being able to relax into the fact that it's happening. They're both enjoying that it is. But let's play the game anyway because it's fun. Mm -hmm. And um, and not because we have to, but because, you know, playing the game is fun. Yeah. And, oh, wow. You, you really opened that up for me just there. I think this is where seduction comes back, you know, particularly with the the shape or the journey that the Azamarata community is on, the men in the Azamarata. Usually they start off and they, they wanted seduction, but they realize that seduction is, is a game and it's in the way of authentic connection and they don't want to do it. They want to be seductive without doing seduction. I want to be attractive and have this wonderful joie de vivre, but I do not want to play the power games. So seduction is a bad thing. And my sense is a power game is unsafe because if I don't admit to you what I'm up to, then I can create circumstances for you that might be painful. And then you have to defend against me. And then with two people in a power game, I'm trying to do something. You feel there's something amiss, you have to defend or do something back. Um, when I'm playing a power game, I'm unsafe on some level. But when I radically stop playing any kinds of power games. Power games can be so small, like even 
you send me a text and I see your text and I think, yeah, I'm just going to leave it. Just going to leave it for a while. So I can get back when I'm, I've got something really good to say, or I, when I feel, you know, in my strong suit and I have the right sentence, I can send it back. That, that could be one. Um, when I start to not play any power games at all, or when I'm able to notice my power games and admit them and come back to a psychologically safe place to you, we are now two psychologically safe people that trust each other. And that's lovely and it's safe. And I'm not going to do too many things in that safe place to poke at you because I want you to feel safe and, I, and trust is important to me. And then we become very relaxed and very safe and not so much happens, right? So in a place where we're both able to be really compassionate, wise, mature adults and in a place where we're able to call up ourselves out on our shit and be trustworthy and safe uh how can i then maximize the energy the intensity the enjoyment the playfulness the mischief in my life because i want it back i don't just want to be this um uh reasonable adult all the time interacting with my woman in reasonable adult like ways i want something back banter flirtation and so seduction comes back and all the seductive principles that you might have learned over the years, they now have a different facet or intention, which is I'm going to do these things that are like the seductive moves, or it could be construed as being power gamey, but I'm going to do it in a way that like provokes your energy and makes you feel something. And I'm going to keep seducing you in a way that makes you feel feelings, that makes you gasp, that makes you irritated, that makes you annoyed, that makes you shocked. That makes you want me. I'm going to turn towards you and turn my head and turn towards you. But I'm going to do that to maximize the energy you feel, to maximize your emotion, and to give you a, a, a take you on a love story, right? The moment that you feel doubtful or you lose trust or you feel unsafe, I will stop that and I will tell you what I'm doing if necessary. But the idea is two people that are very power literate, uh, they can start to push each other to more and more extremes. Why? Not because you need to play the power game, but because it's fun to um, set fire to your buddy a little bit and um, enjoy them shriek in emotion. When, yes. when, when, when you're in the... <laughs> this is why I'm like... I'm, I'm, I make a lot of fun of mindfulness and non-violent non -violent communication, authentic. You don't sit in bed with a girl and say... I'm feeling so much tingling in my heart for you right now. And in a moment, I'm going to insert myself deep inside of you. You, you don't narrate <laughs> authentically everything that's going to happen. You call her dirty names. You bend her upside down. You do things to each other. You, you speak words that are taboo and maybe even insulting. Even in the midst of a loving relationship, like people like crazy things being said and done. And, and you don't do that to be derogatory. You do that to build sensation and aliveness in the other person. So you, you can bring back some of those little, little tricky ways of playing with each other, but you do so from a safe basis. And you don't do, one, you don't do so from a basis that's psychologically unsafe. And yeah, you have a lot of people that become very good at seduction, but they're psychologically unsafe and they create a lot of mess for other people and themselves. So to me... To me, this sounds like the difference is, is doing these things in the light rather than in the shadows. Your very first question, yeah. With your heart wide open, with the ability to put on the brakes, with the thing to say, I'm sorry, my love, I didn't mean to step on you in that way. I want to create aliveness and sparkle. And if I knew that that would hurt or make you close down, I would not do it. And I'm sorry. I'm glad you brought it up. Okay take all the heat out and reset we're in a place of trust again yeah, so the game is only fun if both people know they're playing yeah and if both people know they're playing and both people can play safe and both people see what's going on you can seduction and flirting can just go into to the right. moon so and it's really fun if 
Both people are competent and confident players. Yeah. Yes. And I sense that there have been moments in time, maybe it's I have a romanticized vision, but I sense that there have been moments in history, pockets, people perhaps that were really good at playing the game and they could mutually play. And this is why in some cultures, I think the French speaking world, um, some parts of Europe, seduction has a good reputation as being something that's life-giving and a gift to people rather than being this tricky uh, amalgam of power games, which is how we see it more in the English language. Wow. When you said that, Jordan, I was reminded of Dangerous Liaisons, the movie. I mean, it's right. Like it's kind of what you're referring to here, although it manifests negatively at the end, but still they're aware of what they're doing, right? Like, there's the challenge. Yeah. They're, they're, I, I would say they're psychologically very unsafe in, in Dangerous Liaisons. They're actually dangerous. Um, but yeah, I mean, and, and sometimes in, in seduction, two people start off playing a good seduction game and, and it goes over the edge. And I've certainly done that. It was safe for a long way. We both got heated up and we both got the knives out <laughs> and, and went sharp. Like, how can I get to the center of this person's soul and, and claim it and get there? And, and I have been in a full weapons, sword out game of seduction scenarios with women. Yeah. And usually I, I came off the worst for it. Wow, man. Could it also be said as if it's like a, a game where there's a winner and a loser? That's when it becomes psychologically unsafe. If you if you're making the other person the loser, if you win when you get to the center, yeah, right. Whereas whereas a fantastic experience for all is when all of this is being done and both people win or all people win. So that's so nicely said, and I think just to make this very clear, shadow work. What is shadow work? Well, it's a look at the unknown part of the psyche, the, the ways that your psychology works that you don't know. In your deep psyche is love, sex, seduction, a game of win and lose? Or is it a game where both people can win? And some people don't know exactly that they've got it in a deep level. Yeah, I believe it's a win-lose thing. In fact, what I saw with my parents was it's win-lose. When I look at, uh, let's say, gender criticism and feminist theory, it looks like men are doing this to win, it, win, and it looks like women are losing in this. We need to expose the dynamic. And certainly, um, you know, all this, let's go out and get lucky. Usually the men are getting lucky. Don't know what the women are doing. All this first base, second base, third base home run thing that you guys have in the States, I think we adopted that off the films. Well, the men are getting to a home run. What does the woman get out of that? Does she get a home run too? Or is she just the mound or the, or the turf? So there's all this like hardwired metaphors we carry in our mind. What is it really? And, and I think in a lot of English speaking culture, seduction is, the, <laughs> this is so embarrassing, but check to the extent to which this has been true in your life. It's the heroic story of a guy that goes out, he swings big, he hits a home run, not only does he get the home run, three of his buddies also, you know, make it to home run and all the, all the men win. The whole baseball team wins. Where is woman in this equation? And I, and I think this, this is like the deep code for a lot of men until we realize that there is another side of the table with an experience and we get curious about that. And then you start to understand a few things about power games. How was that? That's I think great. we knocked it out of the park. Oh, boy. 